Welcome back to Get Paid for Your Pad. And today I have a former guest on the show, episode 113. We recorded it in uh, December 2016, so uh, over six years ago. Um, but we have a very special guest, Mr. Daniel Rustin. He's a former Airbnb employee. He's the author of Optimize Your BNB. And he recently published a new book called Profitable Properties, uh, which uh, I already took a look at it. And uh, we are gonna, going to discuss some of the topics in his, uh, in his new book. So uh, Daniel, welcome to the show. Welcome back. I, thank you. For, yeah, thanks for having me. I haven't, um, I haven't seen you in person for a while, but I'm pretty sure also didn't we meet at Air, the last Airbnb open in Los Angeles or France, Paris? Yeah, that's right. Like we met in 2015, if I recall correctly, in Los Angeles at the Airbnb Open. Yeah, I didn't go to the one in Paris. Okay. Whatever happened with that, by the way, they had such big plans for that and it disappeared without a trace from one year to the next. I know, right? I know. Like I went to the one in 2014 and that was really fun because Brian Chesky was just walking around like you could like shake his hand and, yeah. you know, give him a copy of the book and took photos and things like that. Um, you know, obviously, if they do a, uh, if they do a conference like that now, I don't think it would be like that. <laughs> no, he's yeah, they, they, they're on the map for, for now. Yeah. In 2014, was that in San Francisco? Yeah, that was in San Francisco. Yeah. OK, yeah, that I, w I was working there at that time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your, your background. Cause you actually worked at Airbnb at very early stages, right? Yeah, pretty early. I mean, I was employee, my, I was one of 13, uh, in my start class and each week was a start class. And typically at that time, typically two or three were starting. So in my group, there was 11 and this was like, Whoa, there's a lot of new hires this week. Um, six months after I got hired, the start classes were like 50, 60, 70, 80 in the hundreds. And so, um, I worked there from 2013 to 2016 and I worked in finance mostly and a little bit of operations towards the end of my, my time there. And then I went on to work for an Airbnb property management company in San Francisco. And we did our interview in December, 2016. I, this was a very, I don't know if turbulence, the right word, but you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a CPA. So I was, um, working as an accountant, you know, in that role there at Airbnb. And then I left and, and I wasn't doing that anymore. And then I left that company, the property management company, and I started my own company and I sold my first, um, optimization report. I call it online. I think it was in August. So you, we spoke months months after that. And I, I can't remember how I first came upon you, but I know that Brian Chesky, who is, who's the CEO, as you mentioned, you had a jingle, um, or maybe you still do. And he posted it on Twitter, I think. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, have a, I have a screenshot of that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. Yeah. And then, I, and then I, I read your book as well, way back, way back when. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, Let's talk about some, some of the topics that you cover in your new book. I picked out three topics that I thought were interesting. Number one is the top 13 ranking factors on Airbnb. And one of the reasons I've always felt like you might have like a, almost like a secret look, you know, a secret knowledge about Airbnb because you work there, right? So I always felt like, okay, well, I remember when we first met, I was like, this guy has some inside knowledge, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. So. Um, you know, everybody always wants to know how to rank better on Airbnb, especially now that the, you know, we're seeing a bit of a slowdown in a lot of markets. So tell us a little bit more about the, the current ranking factors on Airbnb and also maybe how they, how they, how those have evolved over time. Yeah, sure. So this is, um, this is part eight, the, the last part of my book. And it's the, the top 13 ranking factors on Airbnb as I see it by my observations. Airbnb is very um, private, whether you work there or not, they're very private, just like Google about their actual search algorithm, but they drop hints every now and then. And so, uh, and I'll be curious to get your feedback. I, I don't know, you know, some of them are ob obvious, more than obvious. Some of them might not be, some of them are counterintuitive, but let's jump into it. Yeah. The first one. Them, yeah. So yeah, the, let's do it. So the first one is, is not the review rating, but it is the number of reviews. 
The most important factor is number of reviews. You're going to rank higher if you have 200 reviews and you're and you're um, well. I should I don't know you're going to rank higher, but if you have 200 reviews and a 4.8, let's say, you're probably going to rank higher than someone who has 10 reviews at a 5.0. Mm. And the reason is because of expectations. That listing with 10 reviews, when they get to 200 reviews, Airbnb knows they could be a 4.5. And so they, and so in that early process, if the guest is mismatched, if the guest thinks they're going with a 5.0, because a guest really doesn't know after a point, you know, if there's 10 reviews or 50 reviews, fine. But after a point, a guest doesn't understand, like, you know, they're seeing a 5.0 with 10 reviews, a 5.0 with 50 reviews. I don't know if they know the, the difference or there's a huge difference. That actually takes, like, it depends on the market, but nine months to a year to get those extra 40 reviews. So Airbnb prefers that. They also prefer that for some other reasons, you know, um, which is loyalty to the platform. If you're getting more reviews, if you're having more stays, you're making Airbnb more money, even though your review rating is less. So this is this kind of felt um, this kind of this was a big reason why in the past I would say just list on Airbnb. That's been a departure of mine over the past um, two years. Uh, Airbnb is still the the dominant leader, and they still make things very easy. The number two is the review rating. That's um, pretty obvious. Uh, what I'll say there though is um, a lot of hosts. Uh, oh my my. Uh, the cleaner is, is coming. I might have to leave. I'm not really sure. So my mom gets a cleaner here. And before the cleaner comes, my mom cleans the house. <laughs> so, so she's like, you got to clean yourself. I go into the room. So I'll just continue. And then if she wants me to leave, I'll, I'll leave. I don't oh, know. Good. Um, so as it relates to review rating, um, a f the if you're at a so how I think about it is that if you're at a 4.99 or a five you're you're like doing great there's nothing you need to improve on but as soon as you get down to like a 4.95 you you actually have some a lot of hosts just think they're still good enough and they are still very good but nowadays I'm not I'm not comparing you I'm not comparing myself to somebody with a 4.7 or 4.6 I'm comparing myself to my peers so a 4.95 is still very good but especially when we get to a 4.9 and a 4.8, because I talk to hosts as you do, a lot of the times they have a 4.8 or a 4.9 and they're like, oh, you know, I'm good enough. You know, this, this is good enough. But actually a 4.8, a 4.9, you, you still have, you still have a room for improvement on the platform. So there's a big difference is what I'm saying between a 4.8 and a 4.9 from an algorithmic perspective. From a guest perspective, I would say those two things are switched. A guest looks at the, at the review rating first so a guest might prefer a 5.0 with 10 reviews rather than a 4.7 with 200 reviews. Mm -hmm. So that's something interesting to keep in mind in terms of psychology when guests are going through. And I have two neat videos on my YouTube rather recent, which is I'm a guest as well. I, I live in Airbnbs right now. I'm actually back in my where I grew up in California. But I've lived more than 2,000 nights on Airbnbs. And two recent videos I did about the guest perspective – what, well, when it because a lot of hosts aren't actually guests. So, what does a guest do when they go on to? I did desktop this time. When they go onto the desktop, what's the first things they use? What are highly used search filters? What's the steps in which they're going? Um, so, anyways, the number three is map location, which is um, not really thought about that often. But if you type in Airbnb as a guest, I mean, if you type in a city just type in the city and press enter, no dates or anything, Airbnb is going to highlight usually zones, popular zones of that city. And so if you're in that popular zone, that's a huge ranking factor. You don't really have much control over that. But if you're near a big landmark, a park or whatever it might be, um, you might consider moving the pin because when you start your Airbnb, you can put the pin anywhere you want, literally anywhere you want. There's no check on that. I don't recommend that. Um, but if you are near like a really highly searched area and you're, and you know, go to Airbnb and zoom in the map, Airbnb has predefined zooms. You can't zoom as much as you want. You, you can click zoom and it goes in, you know, however much. So it might make some sense for some host to move their move their move their pin just a little bit closer, not too much, not too much, because then you're mismanaging expectation. You're going to get bad reviews. I've stayed at a guest somewhere where the host went way too close in, and it was like an extra 15 minute walk, which is you know a hassle. 
but something to consider. Interesting. Can I, I just want to jump in there real quick because obviously this, it's not something that we can control for our current properties, but if you're looking to buy a new property, then that might be something that you want to look into is like, hey, where, what neighborhoods does Airbnb automatically zoom into? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's, yep. uh, it's still good information to have. And that's what that that's kind of a that's kind of a main theme of, of the book is that you know when I wrote my first book when you wrote your first book, a lot of people um, not us because we we were a little ahead of the curve if you don't mind me saying so. Um, a lot of people they rented out their whatever they already had typically they already had an extra house or they, but nowadays people actually go out builders are are building buildings and units for Airbnb. Investors are going out specifically for Airbnb. So the process is starting at day zero rather than in the past, you kind of airbnb did what you had. 100%, yeah. Um, okay, so we got the first three. So it's like number of reviews, it's review rating, then it's the location on the map. What's the, what's the fourth one? Number four is acceptance rate. This one is a very obvious to everyone, so I won't, I won't cover it much, but um, ideally, and, and they compare you with your peers. So, you know, if your acceptance rate is um, 90% in your area, then, you know, whatever you, whatever your peers is. But it's going to be typically a very high acceptance rate, ideally 100%. Right. And just to be clear, when you say acceptance rate, it's booking, ex booking inquiries that we get that we accept, right? Yeah. It is, um, it's booking requests that you get that you accept. Booking inquiries um, come into it as well. They're both they're both related. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay. Number five, conversion rate. Um, conversion rate is Airbnb now shows you this on the Insights dashboard. There's four different conversion rates they they show you, and they show you how you compare compare to similar listings. And so conversion rate is interesting because ideally Airbnb wants you to have 100% conversion rate. You know, they're showing your listing to one guest, that good guest decides it's a good list, a good fit, they book you and they leave you a five-star review. The reality is that that's not true. And this metric is a little bit complex because let's say you have an influencer who has um, a YouTube or something and they, and they put their link in their YouTube, they're gonna, get, they're gonna have a really tiny conversion rate because they're getting so many views, but they're getting so many views. And that that is not something I have been able to track so far, but if you're bringing someone to the platform, so this influencer example, he's bringing a lot of people to the platform, his individual conversion rate is very low, but his listing is getting a lot of views. And then what's happening after that, we, we don't know, I don't have any way to track that, but probably what's happening after that is they're staying on that website, they're going to other things and booking other things and might be a first guest signing up. So. Conversion rate and views, um, kind well, of those. Probably better, they probably both play a role, right? Because mm -hmm. I, can, I yeah. can only imagine that getting a Airbnb wants you to get a lot of people to look, take a look at your listing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's kind of, there's like a there's like a balance there. They want a lot of people looking at your listing, um, but if too many, so there's a difference there between like direct people coming direct to your listing and people coming to you through Airbnb search. If people are coming to you through Airbnb search and and few of and not a lot of them are booking, then it's telling Airbnb, okay, we're not showing it to the right person, and that's kind of a bad place to be because the algorithm's like, well, who do we show it to? We already have dozens and dozens of listings which we know book, so what do we do now? Yeah. So that's interesting too, because we, on our end, we just see one conversion rate, but Airbnb obviously is going to look at like, you know, where are those views coming from? Just like you said, like if they're coming from search, then that's going to, you know, they want to see a higher conversion rate than if traffic's coming from outside of the platform. Yeah. Direct. Right. Yeah. Directly to the listing. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Let's move on to the next. I think we're at number six. six. Yeah. Lost yeah. count already. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Um, an interesting comparison is like you know Airbnb essentially is search, but and so we think of when we think search we think Google, but a really it's a lot different because Airbnb sees from the start to the finish as soon as they land on Airbnb. So we're talking about conversion rate and views. Well, they see that they see the direct views coming to your listing, etc. But they also see what the guests did after that. Or if they booked your listing, they see how they had their stay and how they reviewed it. 
and they're seeing what percentage of guests are reviewing and listening. So everybody is seeing the whole the whole shebang. We're only seeing a tiny little bit what they show us, which is in this case the conversion rate. Right. Number six is returning guests. This is actually, you know, I might want to move this up because returning guests is on the inside dashboard. Airbnb tracks it. They track it. returning guests. How many returning guests do you have? Why does Airbnb tracking returning guests? Why is that important to them? Well, it's especially important to them nowadays because if you have a returning guest, which is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of direct bookings, that means you are denying a direct booking probably and asking that guest to book online. You're making Airbnb more money. That's a, that's a really strong signal to Airbnb. So if you have returning guests and they just want to come back for a, a night, um, you might think about getting them to book on Airbnb because also that's basically a guaranteed positive review and review. Um, the review rate on Airbnb used to be 70, 72%. It's fallen low nowadays. So, and who's not reviewing is the positive guests, the guests who had a good stay. So, so a returning guest is, is, can be helpful to the host as well. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Never really thought about that, but, uh, but yeah, Airbnb obviously wants us to, to direct our past guests back to the platform, right? It's also a sign that the guests really enjoyed their stay, right? Otherwise yeah, that too. Going back, so exactly. It shows to them as well that, we, that you're being a good host. And you don't need many of these. In my experience, basically no one has returned guests, very few. So if you just get one every year, every six months, that's you're ahead of the average. And so you're giving yourself as many points in that category as you can. Interesting. So everybody yeah. might think like, okay, well, if you're sending this guest back to our platform, that mean that probably means that you're not you're not one of the hosts that are kind of trying to build their direct booking book themselves, right? So even even yeah. one or two might indicate that. Uh huh. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Number what are we at? Seven, eight. Seven is seven is the review rate, which I wish Airbnb publicly posted. But you as a host know this. So review rate, I'm talking about how many reservations have you had and what percentage of those reservations left a review. That matters in terms of your search rank. Now we're kind of middle way of the list. So these aren't, you know, these, if you improve your review rate from, you know, 55 to 60 percent, it's not going to have a giant effect, but it will have an effect. So review rate. And there's a bunch of strategies um, in the book and I'll give some, I'll give one right now about how you can increase your review rate. And one of the most powerful strategies is upon checkout, telling the guest that you enjoyed their stay. Um, you hope they enjoyed their stay and you're going to leave them a five star review tomorrow when Airbnb allows. This lets the guests know, okay, you know, cause a lot of times you're in, you're in a reservation and, and as a guest, you're like, well, I, you know, I broke the, um, the blender, uh, you know, I, I broke something else. Um, I paid for it, but like, is the host mad at me? You're not really sure. Like, is the host going to leave me a bad review? Should I not leave them a review? Should I leave it? Just tell the guest, Hey, you were great. We're leaving you a five-star review. You're welcome back. Okay. Now they know that. Number yeah, one, two, one. three. I actually used to take it a step further. Uh, I don't do this anymore, oh. but. At some point in my Airbnb journey, what I used to do, I used to get all my guests on WhatsApp and uh, I would actually send them a screenshot of the review ah. to their WhatsApp. So I'd be like, hey, look, I just, you know, I enjoy your, you stay with us. I, you know, I thought you were a great guest. So here's, here's the review that I left you and they could actually see it. I feel like I read that in your book or <laughs> something like that. Cause I remember you talking about something like that for sure. Um, that's good. It's very manual though. Yeah, you know, it sure. is, but, but I'm sure it had a good, <laughs> yeah, it had a good rate, had a good, um, if you're outside the U S that works WhatsApp inside the U S, um, it works less WhatsApp or there's, yeah. there's other, there's other platforms that you use as well, but yeah, that's a good, that's a good, um, tip, especially when you're a new host and, and you need to do this manual work. You know, those first few reviews are very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Those getting those first five or 10 is massive you know you mentioned earlier like you know i don't know if the guests really if there's a difference if you have like 76 or 176 i don't know if the guest really sees that as a different for, you know different uh amount of credibility um but from going from three to ten or something is huge or yeah going from one to five is huge right mm -hmm. yep 
Number nine is Instant Book. Instant Book, yes. Yeah, this is one of the two things that Airbnb has said, hey, you do Instant Book and you get a search, a, rank, a boost in search. And you do get a boost in search for sure. I personally don't have Instant Book on. Uh, but what I do is I have this concept, this idea called the flexibility concept. And, it, and I try and make... The idea is you want to have a very inflexible listing so that you're getting the safest, most reliable guests. So you don't have instant book. You know, you have a three, four day minimum. You have a strict cancellation policy. You have a day before check-in day they have to book, etc. That's a very flexible listing, inflexible listing. And you can do that if you have a very in demand, you're a good host. But there's times when the demand drops and you need to turn up the dial and make your listing more flexible to increase the pool of guests, to increase your chance of getting a booking. And when that happens for me, actually, shoot, I forgot to do it. <laughs> I had Monday, Tuesday, today open. Maybe I'll go do it after this. Um, and, and these are my lowest days. And so sometimes I'll turn on Instant Book and I'll get a reservation soon after I turn on Instant Book, with you know within a day or two later. So it's just one of one of uh, you know one of many things you can do to increase your listings flexibility to get uh, a review, yeah, a reservation. And it's also you can also search in the search uh, filter. You can also select to only see instant bookings. Correct. Correct. So there's also guests that are searching for that. If you don't use instant books, you're 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 not going to show up, even right. Yeah, yeah, valid point. I think we skipped one though. Like I think we were we were supposed to go to seven. We got number of reviews, review rating, map location, acceptance rate, conversion rate, uh, returning guests. Um, oh, fewest cancellations. Ah, there we go. I didn't do that. Yeah, returning guests, fewest cancellations, number seven. Uh, that one's obvious, basically zero. If you even cancel one, even if, I know Airbnb now allows a cancellation under some, some circumstances, even when you do that, I still see oftentimes, I was just on the phone with a, with a host who canceled legally and their listings just disappeared off the map. There's something strange going on with the platform, even if you cancel and it was allowed, it's uh, not gonna, it has a potential to negatively affect you. So you, unfortunately, you know, and I hate to say that because I would wish, that's one of the bo direct bookings you probably talked about. I know you've had Mark on, our friend from Boostly. Yep. Um, that's being coming very big. And that's one of the huge reasons why direct booking is so popular. It's like, it, it, it just, it, you feel like you have a noose around your neck sometimes as a, as a, uh, as a, as a host. And so it, it makes it, it makes you be able to breathe more flexibility into your hosting. Okay. I can cancel on this guest, you know, Oh, the guest, uh, you know, ruined my house. I can keep their secure deposit without going through Airbnb, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one thing I'll say about cancellations too is avoid, always avoid canceling, just canceling a booking. Like always contact Airbnb because oftentimes they will do it for you and no, you actually awesome. avoid the penalty. Yeah, great. That's, that's you know that's that's so huge because I, we had a host in our in our mastermind and in our Legends X program who literally canceled the booking because something happened and wasn't there. What's outside of their control, like a flooding uh, or something. They mm -hmm. would cancel the booking and they lost their super host status for like a year, right? Mm -hmm. Which is yeah, crazy. Right, and you can prevent that. We even had students who called Airbnb several months after it happened, and Airbnb still removed that penalty, and they got their super host status back. Yeah, so it's like these days, like you can get a lot done by just calling Airbnb. Their, their support has, has improved a lot. I feel. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, same with. Uh, I think we're going to talk about this towards the end, but but how to get negative, how to get negative reviews removed, um, which. Uh, you have to call Airbnb, but there's a strategy and you know, what time you call and who you speak with. Yeah. Calling Airbnb, maybe, maybe <laughs> would never thought I would say this, but, uh, under, um, <laughs> under leveraged hosts who've been around like a long time, like us, we, we just basically don't call Airbnb unless they're, you know, we just know we're not going to get help um, and except very specific situations where they might be able to help us. So that was seven, eight was review rate uh nine was instant book 10 is response time mm. yep and on your public listing response time is 
publicly is shown which within one hour is the best you can do of course they know in their internal stuff well are you taking an hour are you taking you know one minute any host who's been around for a while they understand that responding quicker is a very uh, is a best practice you do get more reservations some hosts who are, some guests who are in a in a you know they're trying to book right away you lose the reservation if you don't um respond and I'll, I'll give another tip that just uh, happened to me the other day is as a guest, I was booking and I asked these two, it was part of that video I did for the guest search preference. And so I asked both of the, the hosts for a discount. One host said no. The other host said, um, maybe, you know, I have to talk with someone, I might work, something like that. So I was down to the, my two listings that I wanted, both of them. Um, I, had a, I had an answer for sure, no. They were both about the same price. This one was maybe. So I was like, well, it put me in a predicament because I was, do I want to wait and they both get booked up or one gets booked up um, or do I just want to book one? And so I ended up booking the one that said no because it was a little bit more of my preference and I just, I would rather, you know, I don't know how much they would have given me. So it was just, it was uncertainty. So if a guest reaches out, um, give them an answer or if you're not giving them an answer, tell them, hey, I will, I will respond in one hour, something like that. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, give them a timeline. The next one is um, kind of the easiest thing that you can do. And it does, it's one of the two things that Airbnb has said, hey, this affects, this is a positive ranking factor and it affects your search rank. And that is the number of wish list saves that you have. So wish list saves are, if you're, at, if you're a guest or if you're viewing your listing as a guest would, the top right corner, there's a, there's a heart. If you click that heart, you're telling Airbnb that you're interested in this. You're making some action. You're interacting with the listing. That's a positive sign. And so the more wish list saves, they used to actually show the number. They don't do that anymore. Um, but they do show in the Insights dashboard how many wish list saves you get and how you compare to your um, competition. So that's why you know all of these things kind of work somewhat in, together. So we talked about conversion rate earlier and the views. So this influencer might be getting a ton of views. They might, they, they're, they're probably also maxing out their wish list saves in search of um, search algorithm because they're probably getting a lot of just bonus wish list saves just by people going on their listing. Okay. The next one is uh, cancellation policy. This is something that I believe flexible cancellation policy does give you a search rank boost. Um, they used to have uh, this as a filter, flexible. I, I think believe they took it, taken it away. But um, I prefer, if possible, a flexible cancellation policy. And I've noticed when I do that, a lot of the times, if I get a cancellation, like the same day or a week before, etc., for a host, a lot of times, that's a bad experience. For a host, it's a terrible experience. You have, you know, five hundred, a thousand, two thousand dollars, and it goes away, and there's nothing you can do, and, and you're you feel like you're doing right by Airbnb by providing a flexible cancellation policy, which is what they want. Um, in fact, they say it somewhere. I, I have it. Uh, I have it somewhere. Um, they say on, on Airbnb's listings, they say like they provide a ranking boost for. So I forget the exact wording, but the wording they don't specifically say it, but the wording hints that we are we like flex listings with flexible cancellation policies. So oftentimes, when I get a cancellation last minute, um, I do get a booking. So I believe that they even maybe at just the last minute they'll they'll raise your search rank to try and get you a booking last minute. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like, hey, we like this host. Using a flexible cancellation policy, we recognize it's a bad experience when the booking is canceled last minute, so let's support this host and try to book this listing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not an ideal situation, and I will say there's, there are some markets where a flexible cancellation policy just doesn't make sense. For some reason, there's just there's a lot more cancellations going on, and it's a huge nightmare. Uh, but another reason why a flexible cancellation policy is is um, can be useful is because when I haven't had a flexible cancellation policy, and I'm going through this right now because I switch it on my on my listing in, in Colombia. Uh, I know you have one in Cali. You still have that one? Yeah. 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 I've got one in Medellin, and I switched the cancellation policy, and I switched it to firm for this lady who was coming for her birthday in two weeks. She booked two weeks ago, and she booked a Monday to Thursday, which is like my least busy days. So she had the calendar blocked for a, for a whole two weeks, and I was like, oh, no, she wants to cancel. But I had it on firm, so she can't cancel. So when this happened to me last time, Airbnb, you know, the guest calls Airbnb, 
Airbnb calls me. They sometimes call me various times. They email me. It's just, you know, you have to respond. It's kind of a waste of time. So that that's kind of another bonus with having flexible um, mm. cancellation. So you're saying like even if, if, you're, if you're not putting it flexible um, and the guest wants to cancel, you're still getting pressure from Airbnb to let them cancel anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. They, it, it's actually really annoying. They they reached out to me. Uh, last time this happened, various times, and they're like, "We just want to make sure you're okay with us refunding." And I was like, "I was like, no, I'm not okay. You know, I'm not okay with that. My my cancellation is firm." So, you know, it felt like they were going to. I honestly thought they were going to do it anyways. I went in to check my 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 transactions. I I, I felt like they're just going to do this anyways. That's how it felt. Yeah, they were definitely pressuring me to do that. Yeah. And the last one, and, and by the way, so this is the last one. The last one was the second last one. So these aren't, you know, huge factors. Um, but yeah. think of it in that flexibility concept. You know, if you're if you're low in demand, well, maybe think about changing your flexibility. Um, and then the next one is change, increasing your calendar availability. Uh, simply, simply said, you know, more available days in your calendar. You, you can be you're more you're more showing up in search results. You have more of an opportunity to get uh, views. To get wish list saves, you're 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 just you're being available more, and so that has somewhat of an effect on your overall search yeah. placement. Those are the top. I think there were 13, maybe not 12. And and those were ranked, right? So the, the first ones we covered were the most important ones. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that that last one, even though it's the 13th, like I did notice, like we're going for renovations with our four units that we have in Idaho, California, and uh, so we blocked the calendar March 1st going forward. And I noticed, like, we were almost 100% booked throughout December and the first weeks of January. But as soon as we blocked off that calendar, like, the bookings just dropped off a cliff. Hmm, so I, I interesting. Do, you know, it's like, I, I guess it also, it also matters, like, how much are you blocking off? Like, if you're, if you're blocking, like, a couple of weeks somewhere, you know, six months from now, it's probably not going to have a big effect. But we blocked out, you know, essentially the rest of the year because we weren't sure exactly when the renovation we finished plus our listings are going to be different and we might actually start a complete new account but yeah it had a huge effect for sure on our bookings that's interesting yeah i mean it, it is number 13 but there's probably you know 50 at least a few dozen ranking factors for airbnb yeah um awesome man so yeah this is pretty interesting pretty insightful um it sounds like it sounds like the ranking factors are still you know, fairly similar to what I, what I think they were back when, you know, 10 years ago when we kind of got started. Um, mm -hmm. But it's very interesting to see like the, you know, the, the you know, how, you, how you're ranking them. And uh, yeah, definitely some interesting insights there. Now, before we, uh, before we wrap up this podcast, um, I wanted to touch on two more things that you talk about in your book. Um, one is we can now actually get rid of negative reviews um, and that's a big thing because I know that's a big pain point for a lot of hosts you know they try so hard to be a great host and then they you know they miss one little thing and suddenly boom there's that you know there's that horrible review and it has, a, <laughs> has a bit of an emotional impact on, on a lot of hosts too right so yeah talk talk to us about um, how do we get rid of negative reviews be, also because hosts put a lot of hosts put a lot of effort into the Airbnb listing and there's always when you get human interactions going there's always going to be some times when they just don't get along and so they, they get unfair negative reviews and yeah there, so there is some some emotion going on here I have a whole there's a whole chapter in, in the book profitable properties there's a whole chapter on this and there's a few chapters on you know how to respond to negative reviews how to avoid negative reviews so this is a whole huge topic and there's various things you can do but I'll give um there's something very fresh in my mind because while I was writing this chapter, a friend reached out. He got a negative review. He's, he's doing um, rental arbitrage in Medellin and he asked me and I gave him my advice and he comes back the next day or a few days later and he's like, they denied me. And I was like, oh, that's interesting because I, you know, how you explained it to me, it seems like you had pretty good chances based on my experience of getting that review. So I was like, tell me what happened. And he said, yeah, okay, so I, um, I, I did all this research. Um, there, there, so there's the content policy, but there's also the review policy. So read both of those policies. And also Airbnb can rev remove a review for any reason. Doesn't have to be because it you know, went against the policy. So being nice and friendly is also kind of a big 
soft skill that you have to master. So he said, I researched it and I sent an email and I sent, um, you know, the 13 reasons why this review should be removed. And I was like, whoa, 13 reasons? Why did you, I, so think about it from the, from the um, customer service angle. All you're doing, if you're giving them 13 top reasons why the, why the review should be removed, you're making their job harder. They don't need 13 reasons. They need one reason. So just send one reason, okay? That would be the biggest, the biggest thing. Make the service rep's job easier. Wouldn't it be better if you just call them? Yeah. Did I not say that? You, you oh, typically no, I, call them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because no, I just noticed like you, you, the, the, your friend sent an email, right? Oh, I may have, uh, you know, he may have, after you call them, they send you an e they, they send you a message, right? Uh, and then okay. you can, yeah, I forget. I didn't get into those details to be uh, honest. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, so I, yeah, I think that's a good point, man. Like, I think we have to recognize that when, when, typically when we call Airbnb support, we need something from them, right? We want something from them. And we have to also understand that whenever, whenever we communicate with a human being and we're, we're coming into the conversation with the mindset of, I need something from you, that's not a very good experience, not a very good human experience for that other person. So that, you know what I mean? Like, that's not a good way. If you want, if you want somebody to get something done for you, think about like, how can I make this person's day better? Right. Start with like, start with like telling them that, that you appreciate that they got an, on the phone with you in the first place and that they're, you know, taking the time to help you, right? Mm -hmm. You start with that, then you're already standing out from everybody else who's just like, here's what happens and here's what I need you to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I know your listeners are very friendly, very friendly folks, but imagine not everyone is like us and this rep probably has had some pretty negative experiences. It's like, you know, you have to go through that door. You have to open, you have to answer that call. But you know, as soon as you open that door, you, you know, you have a 50% chance of someone on the other side, like yelling at you. Um, so that's kind of the mentality a lot of these service rep folks are going on. And by the way, Airbnb has, has outsourced a lot of this. So they're not just working for Airbnb. They're working for various different companies. So it, it's pretty, you know, it's not, it can be rough for them too. Awesome. So if you want to get your negative review removed, people, be nice. To the, to the customer service rep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's make right. their job easy. Um, <clears throat> lastly, is uh, you talk about um, how to create a what you call a creative discount that allows oh, yeah. you to charge more for single night reservations. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> yeah, on Airbnb you can't charge for you know a lot of people don't want a single night reservation because. Um, there's, you know, they, they just would prefer, there's a party risk, etc. But what if you could charge 20% extra, 25% extra, then would you be more willing to take a single night reservation? And I'm not talking about um, orphan night is how some people call them, which is like there's two reservations and there's just a single night in the middle. There's actually cust pricing customization where you could raise that. Price. I'm talking about hey, your calendar is totally open. Someone wants to book for one night. You can charge them an extra whatever you want. And I call it a creative discount uh, because how it, how it works is so you, you need to be connected to a smart pricing tool. So you would go onto that smart pricing tool and you would increase your prices by um, 20%, whatever, 25%, whatever discount you wanted. And then you would go to Airbnb and Airbnb has now the ability to add discounts, daily discounts. You could, so you go to Airbnb and you add a 20% discount for two, three, four, five, six nights. You add a weekly and a monthly 20% discount. So what that means is if someone is searching for two nights, they're going to get that 20% discount. But if someone is searching for just one night, whatever night that is, they're going to be paying 20% more. Yeah. And I use that on my own listing and I have gotten um, various reservations at that 20% premium. Got it. So essentially, it's a way to charge a little extra uh, for single nights because they're, you know, they're a bit of a hassle. Um, so you don't really want to offer them at the same price as you offer like the other stays, the longer stays. Yeah, it's kind of that like availability as well. So you're keeping your minimum night at one night, so people are still seeing your listing, but you're getting also a, a premium on that one night. There's also another thing going on where when a guest goes onto Airbnb, they typically show you, this is mostly marketing, but for the guest, they'll show you this listing is $200 lower than normal or whatever. 
So with my listing, it's always like something kind of ridiculous, like, oh, wow. So all guests think they're getting a really good deal because I have this like, you know, creative discount. Got it. Awesome, Emma. This, uh, this was really insightful. Uh, appreciate you sharing all this, uh, all this wisdom with us. Um, yeah, just to, to wrap up this podcast, tell, tell people, you know, where they can find your book to give us a bit of a overview of like what you're covering and, uh, and where people can get it. Yeah, and I also have a special, um, you didn't ask me this time, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm giving your viewers a 50% discount on a new, on a course, my first ever course that I'm releasing for the first, uh, for three months, this code will be good for three months, uh, 50% off. And, um, it is going to be, uh, it, it, it's going to be, it's a course on how to, um, it's kind of an all-inclusive course, I'll say. But you can find more about it at the website, optimizemybnb.com. And one of the things I'll be doing is this year, I'll be going, my next purchase will be in the USA. So if some people are interested, they're, they're new hosts, you can join that course and follow me along where I explore the entire USA for the most profitable markets. And, I, and, and we, can, we can work together as I go through that process. Uh, I have a, I haven't, I've purchased outside the US, but never inside. Those were the first time inside. But people can find me through my brand name, Optimize uh, My Airbnb via YouTube, Instagram, website, etc. And then uh, your your book, Profitable Properties, like what? who's that for? That book is for short-term rental hosts and real estate investors and people who are interested. It's also for um, new or, or interested short-term rental, vacation rental hosts. Whereas the last book, Optimize Your BNB, that was very uh, focused in on Airbnb. I talk about the Airbnb platform only. I, the strategies are applicable to Airbnb only. This book is more broad in terms of running a short-term rental, leveraging the tools all the way from, like I said, finding the actual market and property to pricing it and then to expanding your reach to getting direct bookings because nowadays, you know, when you go to sell your property, if you have a Instagram account or social media account with 5,000 followers, you have a thousand emails of prior guests and you have a website that gets 10,000 visits a month, that actually has tangible real world value. Someone would pay for that. Yeah, awesome. All right, man. Well, uh, appreciate you taking the time. Um, definitely learned uh, a few things here. So yeah, let's, uh, let's keep in touch and uh, I'm definitely gonna read uh read for your your uh your new book and maybe uh you know we'll have you back on the podcast uh hopefully not in six years <laughs> no let's do it again oh by the way here i have this to write my new book i brought my, bought my old book this was my old that's book right. that's right that's yeah, right you, you published that like right around the time i published mine maybe a little bit later or i think you did 2014 yeah that's right yeah mine was 2018 18 okay yeah okay got it Awesome. Well, I uh, appreciate you uh, being on the show and uh, to the listeners. Uh, I'm sure you learned something here because uh, I definitely did. And uh, hope you uh, enjoyed it. And we'll be, uh, we'll be back uh, next time. So take care and see you soon. Bye.